the Wakashu also known as young boys lived a sexually fluid and gender non-specific way of life. The boys had unique hairstyles and wore distinct clothing to mark their status as the love partners of older men. The Wakashu were also able to sleep with women, straddling the line between man and woman while simultaneously bridging the gap between childhood and adulthood. As a result, they're often referred to as Japan's third gender. The Edo period of Japan, the two and a half centuries between 1603 and 1868, was a time of relative peace. After enduring years of fighting between warring samurai, the country gradually settled down. Isolated from the rest of the world, traditional Japanese culture deepened and developed into a highly original expression, one saturated in originality, ingenuity, and beauty. During the Edo period, social organization was complex and hierarchical, and life was dominated by a strict set of expected behaviors and by a seriously enforced stratification of class and age. In Japan, precisely the Edo period, there existed a third gender called a wakashu. The definition of gender, in this context, is with whom it was socially acceptable to have sexual relationships. It was men, women, and wakashu. Roughly wakashu translates to a beautiful youth. Wakashu were young boys between the age of 11 to 25, but the age limits could extend to 7 and 80. It was not the age, but rather the physical aspects that defined this third gender. What defined the wakashu was the clothing and haircut. When a young boy became eligible to be a wakashu, they shaved the top of his head. Then they would put a hair patch on his forehead that would lock with the back of his hair. You can recognize them in drawings by the small shaved area in the middle of their hairstyle. It was the official definition of wakashu. And for unclear reasons, this haircut was very attractive for older men. The wakashu kimonos had long sleeves and were similar to the kimonos of ladies. Another attractive aspect of a wakashu was pimples. They marked the height of puberty, and for those who could have wakashu, this was very triggering. If a man despite his age, kept wearing the long sleeves kimono, and had the wakashu hairstyle, he would still be considered wakashu material. Usually, this was done by male prostitutes. I guess they wanted to make their availability more obvious. Shudo, the official name of this way of life. The relationships that men entertained with wakashu were more of a cultural way of life. There were conducts and best practices for the shudo. Therefore, it was not all about the sexual aspect. The wakashu were like magnets. Older men constantly sought after them, but this was only a one-way attraction. Wakashu were not allowed to have desires for men or seek suitors. Ideally, wakashu were to accept the relationships even if they did not feel attracted to the man approaching them. The wakashu were supposed to feel compassion for the man asking them out. The man would be suffering to do his best to show his affection to the wakashu, so they were obliged to accept as a sign of acknowledging the effort of the man. How big was the effort? Hard to know, but we are guessing it wasn't that much suffering from the older men's part. Once the wakashu accepted the male suitor, they exchanged vows, but it did not only stop there. Some would put the vows in written form. Some would stab their thighs or cut their toes to prove the depth of their engagement. It was pretty intense. The older man acted as a mentor, protector, and financial provider for the young wakashu. He was supposed to be a role model to the wakashu until he became a man. In return, the wakashu gave his body and respect to the older man. Wakashu had to remain faithful to the man he exchanged vows with, and he could only have sexual desires towards women and other wakashu. The man in the wakashu relationship was free to sleep around. There was a bedroom code of conduct for the wakashu and his man, which is very graphic. But to spill some tea, the wakashu were the submissive ones. This was a requirement for the wakashu relationships to be socially correct. The other genders mostly had to have an active role over the wakashu. It is very hard to grasp such a world where young boys were socially recognized as intercourse symbols. Even though the conduct of Wakashu was supposedly a mentorship, the mentor could have done his job without the bedroom part. But who are we to judge? This conduct came to an end in the Meiji period. The Meiji regime achieved this by removing the dress codes and hairstyles. Since it was what technically defined a Wakashu, the third gender was no longer a normal social way of life. This led to the end of the Wakashu as a stage of life.